to join SRS Teflin to participate not only as members of Teflin and participants, but also as presenters at the webinars done by Teflin or SRS Teflin. For this, I would like to uh, show my appreciation to PSPBI Fakultas Keguruan dan Ilmu Pendidikan Universitas Sriwijaya for their good cooperation with SRS Teflin to let their students become the committee of this webinar. Then uh -huh. I also would like to extend my gratitude and respect to the president of Teflin, Professor Joko Nurkanto, and all the uh, all the other Teflin boards all over Indonesia who have already uh, show their uh, supports to SRS Teflin. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, yes, this year, or for this year, since we have the pandemic, we have done almost everything virtually or online, especially those related to academic matters, including having the webinar series to share ideas of interest, which we think, and I think personally, worth being discussed in the forum like this. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, just for you to know that SRS Teflin has tried to empower its members, especially the young ones, whether they are pre-service or in-service teachers of English to be active and also sincere as Tafliners. And their presence today is the proof, ladies and gentlemen, how they love and are dedicated to our association, Teflin. I am very grateful to our young scholars like Busari Silviani, Bu Artanti Puspitasari, Pak Soni Mirizon, Bu Rita Indrawati, and many other lecturers who have mentored their students to make the best of everything. Although I know it is not easy for some of the students to start things from scratch to be presenters. But I believe after Buza, your microphone is muted, Bu. Oh, Bu unmuted it. Okay, <laughs> I, I repeat that. Uh, I'm also very grateful to our young scholars, yeah? Uh, like Ibu Sari, Silviani, Bu Artanti Puspitasari, Pak Soni Mirizon, Bu Rita Indrawati, and many other uh, lecturers. Uh, who have already mentored the students, their students, to make the best of everything. Although I really know that it is not easy for uh, our students to start everything from scratch, especially to become presenters in this kind of webinar or forum. Uh, but as I said, um, I believe that they will be uh, addicted to participate in whatever academic forums related to their 
uh, major and eventually become good educators of English education someday. Anyway, this is it. Uh, in a few minutes, we will be listening to Rizky, Nurul, Rani, Riza, Rahmadika, and Ernawati present their topics concerning multilingualism in practice. Ladies and gentlemen, I would end my welcoming remark. And also, I would say, please enjoy your webinar today. And the following days, hopefully, up to the 30th of September, as it is mentioned by our host today. Thank you for choosing our first student webinar of SRS Teflin and being cheerful participants. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. Thank you very much to Ibu Huzaima for such warm welcome. And then the next welcoming remark is from the coordinator of language education study program to Bapak Sonim Mirizon, please. Okay, thank you, Nyimas. Yeah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Respected Teflin President, Professor Joko Nurkanto, respected Dean of Faculty of Education, Civil University, Professor Sopendi, Coordinator of South Region of Sumatra, Teflin, Professor Huzaima Dahlandim, the committee of the first graduate student webinar, and also all the attendees. Good morning, everyone. I'm happy that you are here. First graduate student webinar, Multilingualism in Practice, Language Ideology, Institutional Policy, and Family Language Management. Ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to introduce myself. I am Sonny Rizan, the head of the Magister Program in Language Education, Faculty of Education, Sibidan University. As the head of the Master Program in Language Education, I would like to say a few words to warmly welcome everyone in this webinar and to show my greatest appreciation. First of all, I would like to express my deepest gratitude to the president of Teflin, Professor Joko Nurkanto, and to the coordinator of South Region of Sumatra Teflin, Ibu Professor Jose Madahlandim, for their continuous dedication toward English education in Indonesia and in Southern Sumatra region, particularly through their ideas and leadership in Teflin and SRS Teflin activities. Next, to all the presenters today, Rizki Aginia, SPD, Nurul Fauzia, SPD, Rani Septi Sapriati, SPD, Rahmatika SPD, Riza Yoga Indriani SPD, and Ernawati SPD. I am thrilled that they are enthusiastic in sharing their knowledge related to the issues they are going to present today. I personally hope that with their experience in studying at the graduate degree and in doing their preliminary research would give the participants, especially the new graduate student and teachers of English, new insight and tips around current issues in English language teaching. Then to all the SRS Teflin committee members, Dr. Arnantisari, Dr. Sari Silpiani, Novalinga Pitaloka MPD, Hari Pratama SPD, and others, yeah, from the bottom of my heart, I am really grateful for the commitment and hard work in making this webinar. Last but not least, to all participants, I wish you all good luck and please 
enjoy your webinar today. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yeah, thank you. Yimas. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yes, but thank you very much for the welcome too. And then here, uh, we've seen that there is uh, the president of Teflin, Bapak Profesor Dr. Joko Nurkamto, MPD. So we would like to invite Bapak Joko Nurkamto to deliver some words for us. So Bapak Profesor Dr. Joko Nurkamto, please. Okay, thank you. Uh... Mbak Panitia, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay. Honorable uh, the Regional Coordinator of Teflin Sumbaksel, Ibu Profesor Dr. Khuzaimah Dahlandim, Honorable uh, the Dean, Bapak uh, Sony Mirizon, the committee and all the participants, uh, first of all, on behalf of uh, the Executive Board of Teflin, I would like to uh, welcome you all to the webinar hosted and organized by Regional Coordinator of uh, Teflin Sumbaksel. Uh, thank you very much for joining this webinar. Uh, secondly, I would like to convey my <coughs> Sincere appreciation to Ibu Jose Mahdahandim uh, and uh, Unsri, is it right, Ibu uh, Yeah, for hosting yeah. this, uh, for hosting and organizing this webinar. Uh, the theme of this uh, webinar is, uh, I can see from the screen, Multilingualism in Practical Language Ideology, Institutional Policy and what? <laughs> blah, 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 management. Okay. I'm happy to see this uh, because uh, I think this theme is relevant to academic atmosphere in the postgraduate study program in Unsri Palembang. Uh, and I am I'm also happy to witness that most of the speaker in this webinar is young generation. Is it right, Bu Khosema? So yes. I'm proud of you all. Okay. Yes, Once they again, are I'm still very, all. very young. Right. So uh, I hope uh, you could follow what uh, Ibu Khosema Dalim has uh, what you call uh, uh, afforded yeah, in this case. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure that uh, you will be, uh, you are a very uh, strong young generation, yeah, who will, what do you call a quote unquote, yeah, <laughs> uh, replace, uh, quote unquote, replace uh, who Jose Mahdalan's team's position in promoting language education in Sumbaksel. Yeah. It's very important for uh, our generation. Okay, so in these occasions, let me uh, take these occasions to uh, express my sincere gratitude to all of the speakers, the presenter, and the participants. Without you all, uh, the webinar will not happen today. I wish uh, a successful webinar today. Please enjoy the webinar. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much to Bapak Professor Dr. Joko Nurkamto, MPD, for the wel welcoming welcome. And then, uh, now it is time for me to let Praisa Jopalina, SPDGR, to take over the webinar as the moderator of the presentation session. To Praisa Jopalina, the Zoom floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for Nimas Lara Sati Utami as a host. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, everyone. First of all, allow me to welcome the presenters who will be share their, idea, their ideas and also their experiences with us today. 
And I would also to welcome all of the participants of the first English education graduate <laughs> students, FKIP UNSRI webinar series in collaboration with SRS Tafuin 2020. Before I introduce our presenters today, I would like to inform you some rules for this webinar. First, in order to receive the certificate, you need to fill out the attendance form that we have shared in the chat box. And at the end of the presentation, we will also provide the exit ticket in the form of feedback for all of you to fill out. And the certificate will be sent to your email a week after this webinar. And also, if you have any questions, please type it on Q&A box and we will discuss it at Q&A session. All right, it's time to begin our first session. I'm honored to welcome and introduce the first presenter today. She is Rizky Aginia Hafiza SPD, and her paper title is Family Language Practice in Non-Immigrant Family, What Can Be Done? Well, without further ado, let's listen to Rizky Aginia Hafiza. The Zoom floor is yours, Rizky. Risky. Okay, are you here, Risky? Yes, please oh. wait uh, for a while. Okay. Can you see the share screen? Not yet. Everyone, can you see the share screen? No, no. it's just blank, blank, just, just black. No, no pictures at all. Okay, for the participants, I remind you, please, to mute the microphone. Wait for a while. I think there's some problem with the PowerPoint. Okay, that's okay. Okay, for the participants, don't forget to fill out the attendance form that we have shared in the chat box.
All right. I'm trying to share the screen again. How about now? Can everyone see the screen? Yes. Yeah, it's clear now. Yes. Okay, go ahead. All right. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, everyone. I'm Rizky Agine Hafiza, English Education Graduate Student FK Punsris. Uh, and thank you very much for the moderator for the chance for me to deliver my topic today. Today, I will deliver you one interesting topic entitled Family Language Practice in Non-Immigrant Family. What can be done? And let me show you the discussion that we are going to see today. I have six parts that I need to deliver. The first one is bilingualism and then English subject and bilingualism in Indonesia and then family language policy. The fourth one will be language literacy practices and then OPOL or one parent one language versus trans languaging and the last one will be the conclusion. Let me start with the first part bilingualism and the question of why. So, bilingual children have benefit to be able to make the friendship conveniently. The parents hope that bilingualism can bring their children to have the better chance to explore the world. It is in line with King and Mackey in their research in 2007. They, uh, they said that bilingual children have social emotional advantages. So, as what I said before, bilingual children have benefit to be able to make new friendship conveniently. It is due to their ability to understand more than one languages and they can understand the new culture and they can learn the new culture so they could uh, they could be able to work with the friends. And then let me continue with Arnberg in 1987 and then Bialstok and Sanman and Gandhara. They mentioned that kids with bilingualism or multilingualism are very beneficial in some areas such as social, personal, cognitive, professional, and also academic. And then a research by Jafar in 2011, he revealed that kindergarten years are the golden age for bilingualism or multilingualism. And then next we have Nicolandis and he reveals his research on bilingual children who gain academic advantages and also cognitive uh, cognitive advantages and the last one is from rosenberg that economic advantages and cultural advantages are gained by the children with, with bilingualism or multilingualism since uh, it relates to their ability to gain the better job and also to gain the better salary and then I have one quote here from Nelson Mandela. It relates to bilingualism, and I, I believe this is one of uh, one of the best quotes in in language uh, to learn language. So if you talk to a man in a language, he will understand, and it goes to his head. But if you talk to a man in his language, it means that the language goes to his heart. And let me continue with the second one. It is English subject, the position of English and bilingualism in Indonesia. So I have some data here. Let me start with the generation gap on the part of age. So from EFEPI in 2019, the result of generation gap in Asia
So, other than adults, age 26 to 30, every age group in Asia posted lower English proficiency scores than, than the result in the last year. And then, uh, it is not professionals in their late 20s. Oh, sorry. Um, okay. So, it is now professionals in their late 20s who have the highest English proficiency overall. So, uh, for those who are, uh, who should be, I mean, who should be in the productive year or productive age. So, the proficiency in Asia is, uh, is considered is considered as moderate proficiency. So we can see from those who are age up 18 up to 30, the proficiency in Asia compared to the world is in moderate proficiency. And it is in line with the result from uh, English First EPI in 2019 that the first rank of English proficiency in the world is placed by Netherlands with a score of 70.27. And how is the score of Indonesia? Indonesia is in the 61st rank, which scores 50, uh, which scores 50.6. Uh, and it is still lower than our neighbors, Malaysia and also Singapore, that Singapore can be in the fifth rank with the score of 66.82. And also um, Malaysia is in the rank 26 with the score of 58 and also 55. I also show you here the data from a research conducted by Mirizen, Dim, and also Bianchi in 2018. So they uh, revealed about the gender, about the proficiency English uh, in, in, in the students of South Sumatra. And uh, it is revealed that the female, the female could have uh, more proficiency in, in English comprehension rather than male. And how about English subject and bilingualism in Indonesia itself? So let us start from Alwasila in 1997. He conducted a research and uh, the result is English is the most significant foreign language in Indonesia since uh, since 18, uh, since 1980s. And also, um, how about the government guidelines or gov uh, government rules? So the two rules from government or government guidelines in 1990, English is used uh, at school. And since 1990, English is approved to be used at school. And then starting from um, 1997 and also 1998, English is used as foreign language and it is it was a means of communication in university. And then from the, re, from the research loader Matarima and also Hamdan in 2011, they mentioned that English is a compulsory subject in Indonesia. Now, how about after the Minister of National Education uh, Pivoting a project from 2013 curriculum. So since 2013, or since the curriculum of 2013 is um, is published, so English is excluded from elementary school level, and it became the local content. And let me continue with the family language policy. Now we are going to see what is the status of English in Indonesia. So, according to Undang-Undang uh, Dasar, Pasal 36 Ayat 1, Bahasa Indonesia is the national language, the official language, academic language instruction, as well as mass media language. And English, English is not even the second language in Indonesia. English is a foreign language in Indonesia. So, it relates to the family language policy in uh, that, 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 we, that we are going to discuss today. According to Chaldas, King, and also Spolsky in 2004, a family language policy is how family is involved in language choices and then how family members choose what language to speak at home. And then Sohami in 2006, he revealed that a language planning, that, uh, family language policy is the language planning that will be used among the family members at home. And also the Howard in 1996 stated that family language policy frames the child and the parents interaction and is responsible for kids language development. So from the family language policy um, definitions here, uh, 
bilingualism are the are the things that the parents and also the the family choose to uh, to be implemented since the kids uh, were very young however it uh, what is that uh, it has the gap with the status of english in indonesia english is a foreign language in indonesia so the first uh, the first language in indonesia is bahasa indonesia now how could uh, bilingualism be implemented smoothly and successfully when english is only the foreign language in indonesia now let me continue with spolsky's language policy model in 2004 so um, spolsky mentioned three parts in language policy model the first one is language ideologies and then the second one is language practices and the third one is language uh, language management so we are going to discuss about language practices that can be that can be implemented in indonesia especially so what is language practices by spolsky's language policy model it is the real or visible language behavior of people now let us continue to language literacy practices so there have been some research some research about language liter literacy practices let me start with Spol uh, with spolsky in 2004 so language literacy practices is defined as what people do with the language and then it relates to any management planning and intervention on what people with on what people do and apply to the language and then uh, from paul Vienen and boyd in 2018 uh, one of the most common approach to use in language literacy practices is OPOL or one parent one language approach. So one parent one language approach or OPOL is the most famous is the most famous approach uh, among other approaches used by bilingual families and also educators. And also Hoffman Hoffman mentioned that OPOL approach. Uh, let the parents to speak with a different minority language at home and it leads to create a uh, trilingual with the third language being the majority used outside at home and uh, in fact opol or one parent one language approach is commonly used by the immigrant families now we are going to see um OPOL versus translanguaging and translanguaging is also one of the approach that uh, are commonly used nowadays and uh, there have been found some research about translanguaging used in in English language learning in Indonesia. So there are some empirical research about OPOL and also about bilingualism. Uh, I will deliver you two uh, research from Indonesia. The first one is from Risto Ningrum in 2017. So she was an Indonesian PhD student in, in OC and how she raised her kids by having uh, OPOL, one, one parent, one language approach. So um, at first she, she exposed her children with Bahasa Indonesia when they were still in, when they were still in Indonesia. And then when they started to move to OC, um, she started to expose English to her kids, to both of her kids. And uh, she spoke in English and her husband spoke in Bahasa Indonesia to the kids. And also, um, there is also one research from Sari and Setiawan in 2015 in Surabaya. And it resulted that kids spoken sequential bilingual with mostly Indonesian and little Surabaya from the approach that is uh, that is used by the parents and also there uh, there are two more research the first one is a journey to bilingualism by kalaishi in 2012 and then one parent one language bond by Brittany and clark in 2008 now let us come to one one parent one language so kalaishi in 2012 uh, he was a he is a german father and Turkish mother and how they raise the children bilingually by uh, having more interactions especially from the fathers to read the books in the target language and then from Brittany and Kirk in 2008 uh, in in the research entitled one parent one language bond uh, the approach is implemented by both of the parents 
have their own language session with the kids daily. So it seems like the parents are taking turns to talk to the children to have more exposure on the language uh, use in the And then how is OPOL successfully implemented in some families, in some bilingual families, the OPOL promises a wide range of linguistic features. So the kids will have strong bond on each language they are spoken. So um, it brings that the kids will fully um, realize what languages that they are spoken. And then OPOL will raise the kids to speak actively in major language use. And also the kids can also master the, the minor language in the family. And one thing that must be uh, that must be warned to those who will use OPOL, consistency and quality of interaction in the family, and also the father's involvement to the language strategy are very essential. So the first one, of course, the support from the family, and after that, how the parents decided to send this uh, to to have the belief and to send the children to have bilingual education. Now, I'm going to move to translinguaging. Let me start from Karpava and his research in 2019. He conducted a research to see three, uh, three families from three countries in, in Russia. And, uh, and Russia is the, in Russian, sorry, and Russian is their, is their minority or their minor language. So uh, from from the research, it is revealed that uh, in 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 Swedish, the family from Swedish, translanguaging is common for them, but it is still unacceptable. And also from uh, the family from Cyprus, the translanguaging is common, but it serves negative view to the family. And also. Uh, a research by Song in 2016, translanguage is to clarify meaning and maintain heritage language. So, uh, translanguaging is also common is also common to be used nowadays in in language in language teaching especially. So, as what I stated before, there have been some research about translanguaging especially with uh, the English language learning in Indonesia. So, translanguaging bring the languages as the parents tool to monitor the children's understanding and using the language and and using the language to scaffold their learning in conversations and then uh, translanguage is used to construct and negotiate meanings and uh, it is to develop negotiation strategies that's the the advantages of having translanguaging uh, to develop negotiation strategies and then to learn the ability to choose a suitable language for a context and to convey sub, uh, to convey subtle meanings. So we are coming to the last part. Which one that will be possible to be applied in Indonesia, whether it is OPOL or one parent one language and also, uh, or translanguaging uh, translanguaging. So the OPOL promises wide range of linguistic features. So the kids will have strong bond on each language they are spoken. And then the approach is simply can be uh, uh, the approach simply can be done by both of the parents. And uh, it is successfully it is successfully done by some some immigrant families. And then um, when one family will do one parent one language approach consistently and the quality of the interaction in the family will be raised uh, the opol approach will be successfully done and also um, the last one one conclusion again from one parent one language kids will be raised to speak actively in major language use and also the kids can also master the minor language in the family so uh, it seems that one parent one language can can bring the two languages or can bring the bilingualism to be successful and how about translanguaging will it be also applied in indonesia so translanguaging is used to clarify meaning and maintain the heritage language and the practices enable children to develop skills in using both languages as reference resources to clarify and refine meanings or some unfamiliar words and expressions in another language and then translanguaging is used to develop negotiation strategies to learn the ability to choose 
a suitable language for the context and to convey some full meanings. So I assume that since um, these two approaches have their own advantages, uh, these two approaches are possibly applied in Indonesia, especially one parent, one language, which is very simple for the parents or for the family to apply it. And we also cannot neglect the translanguaging to be used also in Indonesia, since uh, some schools already adapt the translanguaging approach to teach the students, especially English, uh, especially English learning. And uh, this is the and and the assumption of 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 translanguaging to be possible to possibly be applied in Indonesia is also valid. So that's all about my presentation today. Thank you very much for your attention. And let me bring it back to the moderator. Okay, well, thank you very much for Rizky for the great presentation. And I would like to remind you again for the participants who are watching us from YouTube, you may give the questions to the presenters. And don't forget to put the presenter's name for whom, to, uh, for whom the questions given. Okay, now let's we continue to the next uh presenter today the second presenter is nurul fauzia spd with her paper title is bilingual education program students perception of its implementation okay, for nurul the zoom floor is yours okay everybody can you hear me moderator yes is my voice clear can yes. you see my slide? Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, well. Okay, okay, thank you very much for the moderator for the chance. Now, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, everybody. In this opportunity, I would like to discuss about a topic entitled Bilingual Education Program Students' Perceptions of Its Implementation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Mastering more than one language has been a trend nowadays. In this globalization era, people are required to master more than one language to compete well with all people around the world. In line with this, Ganesha, sorry. Okay, in line with this, Ganesha 2006 state that competence is two in two or more languages is a matter of significant personal, sociocultural, environmental, and political importance in many cultures around the world. According to Ganesha too, for others, the issues surrounding bilingualisms are perceived as problems to overcome. But for others, these issues are perceived as challenges that once it is mastered, it will support the person and even the country they live in. Now, talking about bilingualism, what is actually bilingualism itself? <laughs> sorry, I do, sorry, wait a minute. All right, so according to Beersmore, 1987, bilingualism refers to the use of two or more languages in the context of a communicative case, whether it is possible in spoken or in written form. In addition, Baker 2001 state, bilingual education, bilingualism means two languages practically. He generally indicates that the idea of bilingualism is closely related to the integrations of two languages in a person. In short, we can conclude that bilingualism is the integrations of two languages in a person. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in relation to this term, another term appeared, bilingual education. The question is, what is bilingual education? 
According to Wright, Bond, and Gracia, 2015, bilingual education is the instruction and study of two languages and in, is an, in an educational setting. And in addition, Brice, Jung, and Moore, 2015, argued bilingual education reverts to the formal schooling in which more than one language is used as an instructional medium for our language and instruction in the area of student subject. So we can conclude that bilingual education is the use of two languages as the medium of instruction in an educational environment, in an educational environment. So, ladies and gentlemen, talking about bilingual education program, this program is one of a popular and debatable programs to overcome the lack of foreign language understanding and also diversity in a country. Therefore, many studies conducted in the area of bilingualism and also bilingual education. In addition, Martinez and Hinojosa 2012 argue bilingual education will continue to pose the most contentious and interesting concerns while continuing to be a debatable subject among educationally interested citizens. Then we know that when we use the use of two languages as a medium of instructions in a classroom, it can trigger different perceptions and reactions toward the students. Because we know that when we use English as a one in a bilingual class, means that we are going to use one of the language which is not the student's language as a language of teaching in the classroom. Now imagine if the students have negative perception toward the use of English as one of the medium of instruction, it will ruin the effectiveness of the program in the classroom. So that's why uh, how students behave and how students' perception toward the implementations of the program is very important. In line with this, Lord Turrington 2004 states, students' perceptions about the language they are learning have an influence on the progress and success of the learners in being bilingual. Now, ladies and gentlemen, before we go further about the topic regarding to bilingualism and bilingual education, there are two theories underpin this topic. First is attribution theory by Hitler in 1958 and the threshold theory by Skutnap Kangas in 1977. According to Hitler, attribution theory is a term from social psychology that helps people to explain why things happened and more about the, the abstract perceptions of the individual than the underlying reality of event. He also think that he also applied that attribution theory is also as naive psychology in which it is used to better understand other people's attitude by explaining ways in which individual will justify their behavior lightly. Then the concept of two threshold is better clarified in work of perceptions and bilingualism, according to Skutnap and Kangas. He said that an increasing threshold is the standard of language skills that will have an implication for a child. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what are the main issues regarding to the implementations of bilingual education, especially for the students' perceptions? So here, there are three main issues. The first one is, do the students love to be in a bilingual class? Second, how is the students' perceptions of the implementations of bilingual education? And the third one is students' perceptions in various educational levels the same one another. To talk about these issues further, there are many articles that I have reviewed, and there will be three cases that I'm gonna talk and share with you guys. So the first one is the article or the research conducted by Studianto 2016. The sample of this study is uh, the 27 primary school students in India. So the result shows that there was a correlation between students' previous exposure to a foreign language and their future preference for the language used as a medium of teaching and learning process. What, kind of, what I can draw from this article that the result shows that the with English kindergarten, the student with English kindergarten background has highly positive perceptions over the implementations of bilingual education in their primary school. Meanwhile, the students with Indonesian kindergarten background has negative perceptions over the implementations of the program, and the students with bilingual kindergarten positive background has positive perception. So from here we can see that student with English and bilingual education program has more exposure. So that's why they have more perceptions toward the implementations of bilingual education. And the second study conducted by Rina Zam and Shafei in 2010. So the result of this finding showed that students have positive perceptions of the use of English at a bilingual class and the effect of 
and the effect of bilingual class on their language skills. The findings also showed that students were interested in English. They like to use English and they wanted to improve the ability to use English. However, there are some aspects in this article shows the poor. The result shows that students forgot the lesson when it was explained by using English. The students also argue that they can understand anything when the teacher conveyed the, le uh, the lessons such as science or math in English. They argue that it was very difficult for them and hard for them to understand the lesson if the teacher used English as the medium of instruction during the classroom teaching. So it, overall, this study explains and teaches us about that students actually have positive perceptions over the implementation of the program, but it is not the good perceptions in relation to the language used in the classroom. So teacher, uh, students tend to agree that uh, the teacher to use Bahasa Indonesia for teaching and learning or as a medium of language instruction, but for the material, let's say for the PowerPoint or for the book, they have good perceptions about the use of those things. So in short, they don't like this teacher use English as medium of instruction, but they like it just for the PowerPoint and or the book that the teacher will be used in the classroom. And the last one is from Ospidan Buro and Kulo. The samples are for the Turkish graduate and undergraduate students. The result shows that participants had positive perceptions on a bilingual program in Turkey. 92% of the participants had strongly optimistic perceptions of bilingual education. And they argue that bilingual education will help students to be more successful. It can provide more job opportunities for them in the future. It could improve their English comprehension. comprehension. And this article shows that students in bilingual education, higher education program show higher a higher acceptance, or higher acceptance of this kind of program. They even feel less problems during the implementation. They feel more benefits from the program. Now, based on main articles regarding the students' perceptions of bilingual education, there are three points that I can conclude. The first one, bilingual education is more highly welcomed by college students. And the result shows they showed more readiness in facing the class using bilingual, bilingual languages. They also reveal more benefits from the implementations and they feel more opportunities for the career and for improving their English ability. And the second one, higher education students with older age shows more positive perception than the lower education level of the implementations of bilingual education. So here, the result shows that the uh, students in higher education had higher satisfaction toward the implementation of bilingual education rather than those in the lower education. They even felt fewer problem and it seems like it's not a big problem for them using English as one of the medium of instruction and the last one, students' educational background regarding English or their exposure to English influence their perspective toward bilingual education. So the students who had English before, English background before, or for example, they had English courses for some years and they have English classes, they, they were in bilingual class before, they entered the new class right now, they feel more positive perception than those who didn't have any exposure in English before. So the central argument that I can share to everybody here, bilingual education is more highly welcomed by students with more English exposure in their background. Second, bilingual education is also more highly welcomed by college students. And the third one, students with older age have more positive perceptions toward the implementations of bilingual education. And I basically agree to the implementations of bilingual education itself in a country, especially in a multilingual country, which in which they are using English as a second language or their foreign language, but with some terms and condition and some considerations, of course. The first one that students previous exposure to English needs to be the first consideration to be uh, when before the, the education and try to implement this kind of program, because we know that if the student have no English background, it will Im improve, it will ruin, it will, you know, make them uncomfortable in the classroom. This is also, I feel it by myself when I interviewed my student, like they were in bilingual class and they told me that, yes, miss, the problem is with, I, I never got English course before. So it's hard for me to be in this kind of class. So that's what based on my own experience. And the second, I, for me that, 
uh, bilingual education actually can be implemented in all education level, whether it's lower or higher. But remember, with some considerations like I mentioned before, students in college or in higher education, they show more positive perceptions since, you know, like in, in college, whether they are graduate or undergraduate students, they are already mature and they think about their future more. Therefore, their, theory, their feeling or their uh, the, the, the way they enjoy the classroom will be, you know, they will have more spirit, of course, and they think about their future more rather than the students in lower education. For example, primary education, let's say they were just playing, don't know what for I learned here, like that kind of thing. Okay, so the conclusion that I can conclude it first, students age and their educational level showed different perceptions over the implementations of bilingual education. The higher the education is, the more positive perceptions they had. And moreover, students' language background and exposure also influence their perceptions toward the implementations of bilingual education. And so there are here, there are some uh, recommendations from, uh, that I can share. But for conducting a bilingual education program, an institution, in this case, school or even college or university, they need to prepare everything well, especially for the teachers as a source for the student for learning. And of course, for the students' readiness itself and the book or the material they are going to use. So make sure everything has been prepared well, then conducted the program. For the parents, parents need to think many times before putting their children in a bilingual class. Don't just like, you know, don't ju just think that you need to be here. I want you to be here. So without caring about a student, because the one who will stay there is the student, is the children. So they need to think about whether or not the students or the children can defend or can be well in that kind of class. And for students, they need to make sure that they are ready to involve in a bilingual program. Make sure students know exactly what kind of program it is and what kind of situation I'm going to face. So no regret will appear later on. So I think that's all what I can share about this topic. And thank you very much for your attention. I, I'm, uh, I'll give it back to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you, uh, moderator. Kak Praisa. Kak Praisa. Praisa, sorry, your speaker is on right now. Well, thank you very much for Nurul Fauzia. Thank you for sharing your ideas about your topic. I think it's a great uh, topic and very interesting because you discuss about the implementing bilingual education. Okay, now I would like to remind you for all of the participants, uh, you will get the certificate a week after this webinar, but you have to fill out the attendance form and also the exit ticket at the end of this webinar. Don't forget to fill out uh, that. And now we continue for the next presenters. Like, let us invite for the third presenters. She is Rani Septi Sapriati SPD and her paper title is Language Ideologies Family Language uh, Policy on B and Multilingualism. Okay, for Rani, time is yours. Okay, the, thank you for the moderator. Um, good morning, everyone. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I'm Rani Septi Sapriati. I'm a graduate student of English Education Faculty of Teacher Training Education and Education Sriwijaya University. So in this opportunity, I'd like to discuss about language ideologies, seeing from family language policy on bilingualism or multilingualism. Okay, here's the outline of my presentation today. I'll begin the brief of bilingualism or multilingualism, and then the next session will be language policy, and then family language policy, language ideologies, and Indonesian parents' language ideologies will be discussed in the last session. So let's start. Ladies and gentlemen, as we know that 
nowadays the term of bilingualism or multilingualism is not uncommon in our society they are found in every nation in the world so what is bilingualism what is multilingualism so according to baker 1995 and baker 2000 the term of bilingualism refers to two languages of the person however it cannot be considered as two monolinguals where person masters two languages equally. Baker believes that a person master, most of people in the world only masters one language, one language for certain purpose in certain situation and master another language for another purpose and another situation. So how about multilingualism? The term of multilingualism is similar to the concept of bilingualism. However, it is more than two languages. So according to Kaplan, uh, 1997, multilingualism is a community made up of many individuals who have two or more languages at some degree of competence. So talking about bilingualism or multilingualism, our country, Indonesia, uh, is part of multilingual countries in the world. So according to Roman 2013, Indonesia is stated as a multi, as a second multi, multi country in the world who has got uh, many uh, languages. Indonesia consists of 722 local languages and one official language. It's called Bahasa Indonesia. As Indonesia is multilingual country, when we look around the world, English, English is the most spoken language it is used by many people in the world so based on statistics that i got from daf in 2020 uh, there are 1 billion 27 people in the world who use english so in it indicates that english uh, is the international language uh, english is the global language so uh, it can be concluded that it is important to be mastered by people in this globalization era. So uh, considering the most important of English uh, as, the, as the international language, how about language policy in Indonesia? How about language policy in our country? So language policy in our country is different. It's different from uh, language policy in other in other countries such as Malaysia and Philippines. Uh, in Malaysia and Philippines, they use English as their second official language. However, in our country, uh, based on our language policy, only Indonesia, only Bahasa Indonesia is our official language, is our national language. So uh, the status of English in our country as the first foreign language. Uh, since English is important in this globalization era, while English as the first foreign language in our country. So it challenges family in Indonesia to shape their own language policy. So in order to uh, raise the children bilingually or multilingually, uh, including English. So what is family language policy? According to Chaldas, King and Spolsky, family language policy is about how family members choose what language to use at home and it is started and ended by family itself. Uh, in the past, language I, language policy uh, didn't pay my, much attention to, to family domain. However, Spolsky claims that uh, every domain has a role to shape their own family language policy, especially in this context is parents. So this this topic uh, is suitable with the theoretical framework of Spolsky, Spolsky language policy model. Spolsky mentions that there are three components of language ideologies, a language policy. Uh, there are three, the first one is language ideologies, language practices, and language management. So among these components, uh, they are related to each other. So what is language ideologies? Language ideologies is about the de-ideologies or beliefs or values that people hold about the language concerned. And the language practices 
is about the real or visible language behavior of people. And the language management is the attempts or the efforts to change or modify established language, policy, language practices. So among these components, the most important component is language ideology. Why? Why language ideology is important? Is important component. Come, okay, because language ideology is the foundation to shape language policy. So in this context, family must have strong language ideologies, must have strong foundation to shape family language policy. Uh, without language ideologies, uh, their language practices cannot uh, run well and the language management also. And also language ideologies is about the values, the status, the beliefs of language uh, that the people hold in, it, in this context that uh, parents hold. So what, what do they believe? What must be done? Uh, what must be done? What do they believe? And what should be practiced at their home? So it's according to Spolsky 2004. So based on some empirical research article that I reviewed uh, from different contexts such as immigrant families, migrant families, and transnational families, uh, parents in raising their children bilingually or multilingually hold some values for the languages. Uh, for example, they hold cultural, social, economical, political values, and also they hold uh, values on language acquisition, parents' expectation, and parents' knowledge on bilingualism. So all of them have role in setting their language policy. Uh, while these, these studies were conducted in another context, such as immigrant and migrant transnational families, I'm curious, what about language ideologies do Indonesian parents hold in raising their children bilingually or multilingually? And in my opinion, uh, they may believe that their children will gain social prestige, be successful in education, get better job and high salaries, and also they will maintain their national, their regional, and their global language. So after I review, some studies uh, on language ideologies of Indonesian parents, it is correct that those families uh, hold educational, social, economic, um, and then they hold also at positive attitudes toward languages and they will maintain their national and cultural identity. For example, a study conducted by Sadia and Satyawan in 2019, uh, they conducted a study on multilingual family that consisted of an Indonesian father, a Scott mother, and Japanese caregiver. So this family believes that every language is good, every language is beautiful for their children. So that's why they hold a positive attitude toward languages. They are not afraid if their children are influenced uh, by, by the society. Uh, it is different from a study conducted by Bonafik and Manara in 2018. Uh, they conducted a study on multilingual or multicultural mother in raising their children bilingually or multilingually. And this family uh, believe that English is must, is must to be must by their children uh, in order because they hold social, economic, and educational value. Uh, because uh, nowadays, English is used is as a medium of instruction in some schools. So they believe that by raising their children bilingually or multilingually, their children will get benefit. Their children will be successful in education. However, uh, for the social value, uh, they believe that by raising their children bilingually or multilingually, uh, their children, uh, they will get a high, high social status high social status and uh, they want to prepare their children to be competent in the society and when they go abroad they will be able to use international language and for the economic uh, value they believe that by raising their children bilingually or multilingually including english uh, they will get a benefit economic benefit such as get a better future life such as get better job on or high salaries. And a study conducted by Evendy 2020, um, 
He conducted a study on 28 parents of bilingual or multilingual families from different ethnic and linguistic backgrounds. And most of them uh, believe that by raising their children bilingually or multilingually, they will maintain their national and their cultural identity. So uh, based on those reviews that uh, I mentioned before, so it can be concluded that language ideologies in this context family, it's about the values, the beliefs, the status that family hold to raise their children bilingually or multilingually. And uh, it is found that there are three, there are three values that they hold. The first one is education, socioeconomy, and cultural. For the education, they believe that their children will be, will be successful in academic and uh, not only to get a better future life, but also they will get high social status in the society. And also they will able to socialize with their friends, with the neighborhood in the society. And for the last value that uh, parents hold is about the cultural. They will maintain their national, their regional and heritage language. And they will also maintain good relationship among uh, family members. So the, the significance or the implications of this topic, it provides information and knowledge to everyone about the reasons behind bilingual or multilingual parents' decisions. And also it motivates other parents to examine or modify their own language ideologies to shape their family language policy in raising bilingual or multilingual children. And it influences teachers and policy makers to support families in raising bilingual or multilingual children. And the, for the suggestions and the recommendation, I suggest for those who want to raise their children uh, bilingually or multilingually to consider the foundation, the language ideologies in order to get successful family language policy on bilingualism or multilingualism. And for the further research, it is expected to conduct a, large, a larger scale uh, about the family language policy in Indonesia context. Okay, I think that's all for, for my presentation today. Uh, thank you for your good attention. Back to the moderator. Yes. Well, after hearing uh, Rani's presentation, we can get new information about language ideologies. So thank you very much for Rani. Now I would like to remind you again for the participants if you have any questions, please type your question in a chat box so the committee will see it and we will discuss it at the end of uh, the presentation. And also uh, you can join the SRS segments webinar in Zoom meeting and also YouTube. So we have uh, five days to uh, join the SRS Stefflin's webinar and we still have four days for the next webinar and I'm sure then I believe that the presenters will provide you the interesting topics so please join our webinar okay now we continue for the next uh, presenter today the next presenters it's Rahmadika SPD and then yes and uh, the title is emi in math and science primary classroom how can the concept be thought okay now the zoom floor is yours Ramadika. okay wait start. Okay. Wait, I'm trying. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Okay. Uh, thank you, Praisa, for the chance given to me 
to explain, uh, to deliver the presentation today. My topic today is English as medium instruction in math and science, primary classroom. How can the concept be taught? Uh, as we know that there are there are some schools, especially in Palembang. There are some school in Indonesia has has adopted has has been adapt, has adopted English as medium instruction to teach subject uh, content subject. Uh, on this occasion, I would like to deliver the material only in teaching math and science in primary classroom. Okay, my outline, my outline will be the first, what is EMI, English as medium instruction, and then the implementation of EMI in this classroom. Uh, then I will explain, I will try to deliver what fact about EMI itself. Then the next is about why is studying math or science important? uh when when studying math and science using using english and then the conclusion okay i have said that there have been there have been many schools offering bilingual bilingual or english programs only they offer various international programs such as cambridge singapore or even australian curriculum as we know uh so far that i i see that uh, there are many schools in Indonesia. Okay, uh, let me say in Palembang, they have been, they have uh, used, they have, they have applied EMI to teach math, science. Some have also have developed their curriculum, uh, their curriculum by having collaboration with some university for their curriculum development. Uh, as one of the most implemented products as what uh, I got from British consults. One of the most implemented products of language a policy is, I'm um, sorry, wait, wait. Uh, sorry, sorry. Wait. The EMI EMI has gained. Um, wait, I cannot see. Has gained its popularity. Oh my goodness, I can see the. In the last few decades, EMI has been observed in many educational institutions, including, but it's not limited only in the higher education, but we can apply it in primary school uh, but it's it, it's depending on a specific circumstance so the use of emi is possible to be extended on a primary uh, and secondary level so uh, we not, we are not just teaching math and science or the subject i mean uh, only for the higher education level but we can we can apply it on primary and secondary level. Okay, next. My goodness. I cannot see the. Um, sorry, sorry. Wait. Okay. What are some facts about implementation ME in math and science? Uh, the main is issue with elementary school English teaching in Indonesia is a huge uh, shortage of competent and qualified English teacher. So, in fact, like this, I want to tell you about. Uh, I I already have uh, some interview, actually. Um, I I asked my friends, my friends, um, uh, uh, who who teach English, who teach English, who teach math and science, but use English. Actually, uh, the teacher don't, don't only have limited English proficiency. 
but they have um, they have to prepare the skills of the pronunciation, the spelling, uh, uh, the spelling of the students. The implementation of teaching math and science in English is um, uh, okay. Let me say it's much difficult when we want to when we are teacher uh, teach teach the students use English. But uh, remember that math and science, math science, uh, it is because because math and science has a specific specific language vocabulary structure. So that's why uh, it's a little bit uh, difficult for teacher, for English teacher who has not, we has not a background, background in teaching math or science, uh, background in teaching math and science uh, in English, I mean. Uh, so the teaching math science is more challenging than only teach, teach a subject. For example, I'll give you uh, the topic. I, as a teacher, want to teach a fraction to the students. Okay, then of course we will we will use the target language, the target vocabularies. It will be the problem, the problem if they don't know the vocabularies relation to the fraction. For example, numerator, denominator, equivalent. Or they don't, they don't know the meaning of uh, perkalian, uh, pembagian in, in, in English, I mean, is divided by or addition, uh, something like that. That is the problem when the teacher teach math, science, concept. That is the problem. Uh, that is one of the problem when we are teaching English, we are teaching math and science using English. That is one of the problem because of some teacher has not uh, the background, the background in teaching, uh, I mean, uh, math, math and science, um, science knowledge, right? Then why is learning English, uh, learning math and science is important for them? especially for the school who has been who has applied the, the applied the bilingual bilingual education they, they use EMI right they use English to tell to tell to transfer the materials to the students it produces children to concept skill thinking strategies that are, that are essentials in every every day For example, uh, it, it will help children make sense of number pattern. Uh, pattern, so uh, it, it is over, over ways of handling data and increasingly digital of a career's contribution to their development access as successful learner. Why is learning math and science important? The understanding and the uh, the barriers. Well, I cannot see identifying and understanding the barriers that prevent students from learning mathematical concept would allow more students to learn mathematics and be able to transfer their knowledge to other subject areas. Uh, according to Rikomini, Smith, Schultz, and Fries. in general, communicating using the language of mathematics requiring a straw requires a strong background in mathematical content and pedagogy, a good common of the English, um, well-developed number sense in the ability uh, to think, uh, it makes them to think critically. Uh, this, is, uh, this is belongs to uh, Dell and Cubes, as I spoke with teachers, I did research for this article. Uh, they found that when the teacher teach, teacher teach word problems, so the students will get difficulties in understanding and using mathematical vocabulary correctly. So this is this is 
the skill to require a language re proficiency that sometimes exceed our expectation. So uh, we tend we tend to think of mathematics as a subject that doesn't doesn't require a strong common of language. In reality, in reality, mathematical reasoning and problem solving are closely linked to the language and really upon a firm understanding of basic math vocabulary the first that i told you that uh, uh we have to enrich the vocabularies to the, the vocabularies that has relation in math and science so that we can we can teach we can we can combine we can use emi english as medium instruction in teaching math and science in that class by using english as medium instruction the students would be able to understand the lesson course and are capable in use english so the aim of ami and teaching math and science is to make uh, to make uh, to teach the content the content i mean uh, the concept of math and science but you can also we can also uh, let them use the use the opportunity the opportunity to speak English all the time to teach the uh, to teach the to teach English to the teacher to to friends in the class. The use of a EMI could be regarded as an effort to renewal in the field of learning with target. Ah, this is the. This is what I said that, okay, they will get two objective, uh, they get subject confidence and then they get the language. So they can get the concept of teach, uh, I mean, okay, let, let us say, let me say that, uh, okay, I will teach the uh, math, mathematics, right? The mathematics addition or multi multiplication or division, division, so they get, uh, they get to, they get to, they get the concept and then they learn English language. language. So that's why uh, we can combine EMI in teaching math and science. By using English as medium instruction, student, I'm um, sorry. Oh my goodness. I'm sorry, wait. Wait. As what? The, as what? Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I just missed this implementation of EMI. As what Dixon said, the use of the target language in the classroom greatly increases the students' exposure. The students' exposure in English, right? Uh, so using the target language in the classroom, they are they are receiving more beside the content, beside the concept of math and science. So they can learn English. They can, uh, they can learn, they can get the language. Using target language in the classroom can provide a source of uh, modeling for the students, both in regard to the production, the production of the language and attitude toward the language. And then there are, uh, from here, uh, from another, there are some positive results learned from the EMI, EMI implementation. Students instructed with EMI show an enhanced, enhanced flexibility in foreign language communication, right? And then they are they are able to um, to talk about a scientific scientific things in science, and then they can uh, they can explain the concept of math. I'm sorry, wait. Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, uh, and the last, it, it, it's in that's, okay. The control, the, uh, I get, I get the point, the point here that uh, we can use EMI implementation in Indonesia. In Indonesia or in, or around our region, to improve students and teachers' general proficiency in English is not uh, because um, using using English as a medium 
to teach content subject allow students and teacher more exposure to the language i mean the compre comprehensive the compre comprehensible input and opportunity to use it rather than teaching only teaching english as a subject in teaching science and math also uh, through english we were not maximally implemented because of some factors one of them is limited uh, english not only so uh, I told you before that, okay, uh, let me see. We want to teach them, uh, teach your students, your student, uh, addition, multiplication, or fraction. Uh, but the first that you have to uh, enrich their vocabulary uh, relation, relation with math and science. Teaching curriculum subject in English at primary level can be, um, belongs to Liz McMahon. At first, teaching curriculum subject in English subject, for example, which is uh, math and science. Yeah, at, at first it will be so difficult, uh, difficult. But but in fact, we can we, we we have to know we have to know the what what we call. We all know how to how to solve this problem, so that we can we can combine the EMI EMI. They can learn English and then they can uh, learn math science at together. Okay, I think that's all uh, my explanation about. EMI in teaching math and science in primary classroom. Uh, for for those who are for those who are teaching teaching math and science, uh, well, we'll have so we'll have so what we call um, difficulties when teaching learning. Oh, okay. What what language we will use, or we can we can use the because uh, as we know that some of the students will be so comfortable with their mother tongue, right? When the teacher explaining transferring the materials, the uh, transferring the material in English, they they will get difficulties uh, because because they they don't know the the vocabulary the vocabularies they get, especially for primary school is still is still uh, I mean they get the term 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 some term is unf un unf unfamiliar for them. So that's why. So that's why uh, for the school, I think it's better uh, for the school who wants to apply this. They um, already prepared, prepared the students, uh, the students to get to get to get know. Uh, I mean, they get more about the vocabularies that has relation with math and science subject. My goodness. I'm so, I'm so sorry. Uh, Rahmadika, your microphone. Okay. Okay, uh, I think that's all for today uh, for the presentation about the EMI in primary classroom, especially in teaching math and science uh, for primary. Uh, thank you very much for the chance. Uh, I'm sorry. That, uh, well, thank you very much for Rahmadika uh, for your uh, interesting topics, I think. So I can relate your topic with my experience before when I were in primary school, junior high school, and also senior high school. I had trouble also in learning math, even though my teacher uh, explained the material using Bahasa. And I don't know what happened if uh, my teacher explained the material using English. Yes, so I think that's an uh, interesting topic. So now uh, let uh, let us invite 
the fifth presenters in this webinar today. And then she is Riza Yoga Indriani SPD. And then her paper title is Parental Parental's Beliefs as a Part of Language Policy, Bilingualism in Early Age. Okay, for Riza, time is yours. Okay, so could you see my screen right now? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you for thank you very much for the time. So uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Lisa Gendriani. So I'm here to present about parental's belief as a part of language policy, bilingualism in early age. Okay, so this is the outline of uh, this presentation. The first one is I will I will uh, present about the, the rationale of the topic. The second one is bilingualism. So it explains what bilingualism is. The third is about language policy. So it consists of the explaining of what language policy is. The fourth is about parents' belief. Next is about the ways to support bilingual children. The sixth is about the benefits and barriers in raising bilingual children. Uh, seven, conclusion, implication, and recommendation. And the last one, there is preference. Okay, now, it's about the rationale of the topic. Uh, as we know that the role of family has a central and, and very crucial part for supporting bilingualism in early age. There has been a, control for, a controversial dilemma for over a period of time, especially in globalization era. So, um, to support bilingual children, the parents must have a role in uh, in supporting bilingual children. So, it must be it, it it must have family language policy. And one of the important family language policy is parents' belief. So, uh, there are two kinds of parents' belief according to the Howard 1999. There are uh, weak belief and also strong belief. Here, according to the Howard 1999, most parents have different beliefs, including strong Mr. and also Lisa? weak beliefs. Yeah? Can you please speak a bit louder because it's quite not clear for us to listen to your voice? Okay. Hello, Risa, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, can you please speak a bit longer? Speak up. Okay. Uh, a strong you. belief has a positive okay, impact. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, I will continue my presentation. So, a strong belief has a positive impact on children's language policy, but in other hand, there is a weak belief. So, a weak belief means that there is no support from parents as the as the result so uh so the, the, the development of language of children is supported by environments such as peer groups and also uh group plays for example like in school environment or uh, or people around the children okay so before we before we discuss about what bell what family language policy and parents' belief. So I will discuss about bilingualism itself. So according to UNESCO 2010, states believe uh, bilingual education is the priority to improve access and quality in natural environment. But in OECD 2016 states that the competence of global involves a variety of skills, such as the ability for communicating with more than one language. So it is uh, supported by Cooper, Elena, and Joseph 2001 mentioned that bilingualism, that there is the process of children learning uh, more than two, more than one language. So uh, we can conclude that bilingualism is the ability of someone or the children uh, to I'm acquire sorry, more than one language. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, Mirza. Yeah, now Louder, it's loud, please, but Mirza. when you explain. Yeah, can you hear me right now? Is it clear? Okay, now it's clear. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, there are two kinds of bilingualism according to Hua and Lee, 2000 and 
five, uh, there a, there are a plain and also an unplanned bilingualism. So what are they? The first one is a plain bilingualism. A plain bilingualism means that uh, there is the internal factors that influence children to have bilingualism. For example, uh, of course it is consciously. For example, uh, there is the belief of parents that enroll or enter their children to uh, to bilingual or international schools so uh, there is the there's parents belief that the children will have a better career in the future or better job in the future so it is it mean it is meant by purposeful decision and the second one is an unplanned bilingualism it is from the external factor for example uh, the the children can can socialize and interact by people around them so uh, the major the major external factor is the peer groups and also uh, the friends around them so the children can acquire the language from their society or their communities okay next it's about language policy um commonly language policy is not also uh, policy, I mean, it's not also in, it's not also implemented by institution, institution, I mean, but also in family, especially in family language policy. So, in our, according to APEC 2008, defines that language policy is striving to respond to world's, the world's and regional over time, influenced by some aspects such as globalization, industrialization, colonization to maintain community language. So it is supported by Larasati, Sri and Zainuddin 2018. They state that family language policy is applying of certain of language policy or rule at home, conscious and unconsciously. And according to Squart and and Anna 2013 that having successful family, it must have educational linguistic background, language policy and good management and also planning. Okay, the next is about parents believe. As we know that there are three kinds of important uh, language policy from Spolsky 2004, they are uh, there are practice, belief, or ideologies, and also good management. So here, I will explain also in parents' belief, uh, because parents' belief will influence the parents' practice and strategies and also ways to support bilingual children. So he describes, I mean, Spolsky describes language ideology as a values and, situ and situation when people or parents decide to use different languages in their community or environment so that parents might have positive impact belief to support ch children's language development according to Nakamura. So parents' belief will, uh, especially strong belief, will influence um, how children can acquire the languages. So it is supported by the Howard 1999. Uh, she states, there are two kinds of parents' belief. There are strong belief and also weak belief. What are they and what is what the, the explaining of this belief? Strong belief is parents have a belief to practice and also control the manage uh, the management of their bilingual children. So here, parents have a good belief so they can uh, they can support their children to have a uh, what more than one languages so but what is weak belief weak belief weak belief here means there is low belief and also weak competence of parents so they cannot support and encourage their children being bilingual and that um as my explanation before that parents belief will influence the children's being bilingual so here there are the factors of parents belief in raising bilingual children according to putri 2019 and patama 2017 they explains they explain about the factors of parents belief the first one is parents have educational background of parents. So for example, there are parents who have, who were graduated from educational education, uh, language, li li language, linguistic education, for example. So they can, um, they can give 
their children's uh, the language, uh, English language, for example. So the second one is about facing globalization era. Uh, as we know that we face globalization era, especially in 21st century. So uh, it is for the children to uh, to face and be able to communicate and and society and, and socialize so, socialize for for the people around the world and the third one is generating good personal character since by learning language so here uh, children can have uh, different languages so they can learn different culture also the fourth is about getting better job and scholarship or student exchange from abroad. So this is very, uh, this is a, most parents believe this factor. The, the parents uh, believe that, yeah, le, uh, having raising children will, will be, uh, will benefit for their children. For example, like uh, getting better job and also can uh, better, can get better future career and the next is uh, understanding of English use as information or instruction by public places or social media so here there are many information uh, using English so children can easy learn and easy speak in uh, in English, for example, so they can acquire the information easily. The last one is enrolling their children to international and also bilingual school, for example. Uh, so many people believe that, uh, for example, like the parents do not have a uh, language educational background. So many parents enroll and enter their children to bilingual and international school. Okay, now it's about the ways of parents believe uh, here i found two kinds of research studies from indonesia so there are two kinds of uh two kinds of different uh, perspective the first one is uh, from putri 2009 says that many parents believe in indonesia apply opol OPOL means one parent, one language, two bilingual children. Since uh, these parents have educational background from English language education so that they can speak to children fluently. For example, fathers speak Balinese and Bahasa Indonesia. Meanwhile, mothers speak English. So children can get two languages directly. But another research study from Media Study Study, 2000 and, uh, 13 clarifies that there are uh, still uh, there are parents who have low English competence and do not understand how to teach and speak to their children. But the parents uh, themselves want to uh, wants to their children being bilingual, so that they so that they or parents send their children to bilingual school. <laughs> okay, so there are many. Actually, there are many ways of parents believe to support and, pra and practice uh, to their children being bilingual, uh, according to Cunningham 2011. So the first one is first, talking to your children as the first step. Yeah, as we know that children, uh, before children produce the language, so children have to talk, uh, children have to listen first uh, what the parents talk. So the first step is talking to your children and introduce the languages. The second one is listening to the child while having conversation. For example, uh, you talk to your children and you have conversation with them. So you can uh, analyze and correct the children. For example, if the children have uh, incorrect pronunciation or vocabulary and etc the third one is after you talk and you listen to your children you may document uh, through written text and recording by video for example if you have three children uh, and and the and your children uh, are bilingual so I think the 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 progress and the process 
of your children's uh, being bilingual are very different, right? So I think document, uh, documenting through written and also record video, it is important for you to determine the differences about your development of children. The fourth is reading a minority language to children. So uh, this is, I think it's very important because um, it is the, 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 the strategy that can stimulate your children uh, and your children can get and acquire um, many vocabulary. So it can develop your your children's vocabulary. The five is about asking them to read. Nah. And after you read uh, the minority language book, for example, you ask uh, the children to read by themselves in order to uh, listen to their development of languages. And last is obtaining media, sources, and materials in the minority language. Um, you may, uh, you may, or uh, you may uh, buy a minor, uh, buy an audio book, for example, for your children. You may, uh, you may provide DVD or film by, by using or by speaking English and etc. I think it's the most important things. Okay, here. There are the benefits of uh, raising bil bilingual children. For example, there are many kinds or and aspects of benefits that uh, bilingual children can get. The first one is cognitive. The second one is career. The third one economic. The fourth one is neurological. Next is intercultural, and the last one delaying Alzheimer Alzheimer's diseases. So the first one is cognitive. Uh, we, uh, as we know that per, uh, children have, have, uh, have to speak more than one language. So I think that, uh, yeah, and I think that this is can increasing, uh, can, can increasing the, the metalinguistic of children and also uh, can have uh, analytical strategies and also can think creatively for the children. And the second one is career. So having better career, academic Sorry to for enter. Interruption, Riza. Yeah. Sorry for interruption, okay. Riza. Your okay. uh, presentation presentation's time. Not more than five minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So career, ca uh, many parents that uh, many parents that believe uh, children's bilingual children can get better career in the future and economic the opportunity to earn high income and uh, obtain a better uh, better status in influence and influential society neurological since learning more than one language early ch uh, children can acquire language and flexible to switch different language intercultural means that uh, having successful communication, they can encounter better comprehend in different languages and culture. And also, it can delay Alzheimer's diseases for about four years. And the barriers. There have barriers in bilingual children. For example, if, if there is an attitude of racist and discriminant in the majority population, so it will have problem for the children, especially in emotional and psychological. It will cause, the second one, it will cause a delaying languages, uh, the language mixing and also in incompetence of children. And the last one is because the children have more than one language, so it can be frustrated and also have the, the communication difficulties because uh, they learn to different rules and to different mechanism. Okay, so the conclusion is the central element for shaping and developing bilingualism in early age is a family environment, especially parents believe as a part of language policy to manage and expose the minority language frequently. And not all parents have different, have the same parents 
belief. So parents' belief must have in positive belief so they can encourage and develop their bilingual children. Okay, that's all my presentation. Thank you so much. I'll bring back to the moderator. Thank you very much, Riza, for the great presentation. Now we continue to the last presentation. And the presenter is Ernawati SPD. And the title is English as a Medium of Instruction in Primary Schools, Some Challenges. OK, for Ernawati, you have 15 minutes to present your material. OK, the Zoom floor is yours, Erna. Thank you. OK, thank you so much for the moderator. Can you see my uh, slides and also my voice here? Is it clear? Okay, it's clear. Okay, clear. thank you very much. Okay, uh, all, thank you very much for this chance. So actually this is, um, I would like to share about one topic that very interesting for me, which is uh, about English as medium of instruction in primary school. So this is, I would like to focus on the use uh, EMI for some challenges faced in primary school. So here I am Ernawati as an English education graduate student from Faculty of Teacher Training and Education, Sriwijaya University. Okay, let's go to the first slide. Okay, so the outline of my discussion today will be introduction, and then we'll be continue about the definition of English as a medium of instruction or EMI in primary schools. And then the third one is the benefit of using English as a medium of instruction. And then some challenges on using English as a medium of instruction or EMI in primary schools. And then some facts I will appear that. And then the last one will be uh, some recommendations from me and then uh, for a conclusion too. Okay, next. Okay, for the introduction. As we know that there are many uh, countries around the world that compete in many aspects, such as the aspects are social, political, um, economic, and also the education activities around the region. It is continent in the global uh, globalization era. It is one line with what Finocchio in 1969 states that language plays an important role as a means of communication in those fields, especially for the education aspects. So here, the language plays a very, um, a very important roles around those uh, fields, especially for the education aspects. As what Wolf in 2005 said, uh, stated that uh, language is not everything in education, but without language, everything is nothing in education. I really agree about this, what Wolf stated to us about the language, um, the importance of the language. So uh, being of that, uh, English is the most international language used in the world. So it is appropriate that uh, to what View and Burns in 2004 said and quoted from Crystal in 2006, he said that it is not a treason to state that English is spreading rapidly around the world. So much countries use English as uh, the international language than the other countries. So um, depending on those phenomena that um, so many researchers try to conduct some studies that um, include the use of English as medium of instruction to some um, aspects like um, the perspective of the, uh, the perspective of the teachers and the students and also like um, how is it the implication of the use of English as medium of instruction? But here I uh, interested on the challenges faced. But here mostly the researchers just focus on the uh, the the what the conducted conducted the study just about like the use of English as medium of instruction in the higher level because as we know that English is very very like very useful in the higher level, not in lower level. But according to what um, British Council in 2004 said, EMI has been observed in many educational institu institutions, including but not limited to higher education level. So this is actually same to what uh, Rama said before, uh, depending on a specific circumstance, the use of English as medium of instruction is possible to be extended on a primary and secondary level. It is 
according to British Council. So it means that the use of English as medium of instruction can be useful to the lower level of education like primary school or even in the secondary school. Okay, we go to the definition of EMI. I'm so sorry for my voice here. <laughs> okay. So here I got some definition from some research. So here about uh, the definition of English as medium of instruction from Julie Durden. So as we know that Julie Durden is a senior researcher so English as medium of instruction and also the development below of EMI here. Uh, she defined that EMI as the use of English as language to teach subjects in countries or jurisdiction where the first language or L1 of the majority of the population is not English. It's uh, similar to Indonesia, right? And then what Medifan et al. said in 2014, EMI essentially refers to the teaching of a subject uh, where the using of English as the medium here uh, not as not an ex explicit language learning aims and where English was not the national language there. So um, I uh, bold here, uh, he said uh, the Medifan at all, they said that the use of English as medium of instruction doesn't have explicit language learning aims. So is there any like beneficial uh, on the use of English as medium of instruction here? So based on those definition, I can conclude that, I'm sorry. I can conclude that in an English as medium of instruction in the classroom, the aim is not to learn or acquire the language at all. It means that uh, the aim is not to learn about the English language because the use of English language here is in, in another subject such as what uh, Rama said before, it can be used for mostly around the world, schools use uh, the English of medium of instruction here used in science, like science subject and also the mathematics and etc. So the language serves only as a tool here, as a vehicular language in which content needs to be learned and thought, used to the country where its first language is not English, especially, yeah. Okay, there are some benefits of using English as medium of instruction, according to Kyrgyz in 2014, and also uh, Dearden, they said the similar benefits of using English as medium of instruction, which is EMI was reported to have a benefit such as enhancing English language skills, access to primary sources in English, better employment prospect, and keeping up with global de uh, development. Uh, so here, English as medium of instruction can be like um, develop the proficiency of English is late, is lead to be an excellent uh, tag to worldwide domain. According to Karnofen Su in 2017, the main benefit of using English as medium of instruction is better accessibility of English material as well as the existence of better curricula that like um, the private school use uh, like they use this uh, the government curriculum and then the other side of curriculum like a broad cu curriculum, and then it, uh, from the benefits of using English as medium of instruction, it can be get a better job for the students in the future and also the career that wider change to uh, communication. Okay, now here uh, the uh, the main focus of my topic today. The use of English as medium of, of instruction in primary school. So mostly of the researcher just talk about the use of EMI just in um, higher level of education. According to Deptic Boot in 1994, the government policy allowed the elementary school to teach English subject. As we know that uh, the global uh, the phen this phenomenon of English as medium of instruction appears because of the use of English subject in some schools around the world. So in Indonesia, it is uh, that time like uh, started in the fort, in the great fort and uh, in that book in 1994 state, it is a good step 
when we start the use of English as medium of instruction to the elementary school because it gives students opportunity to, uh, to learn the language earlier. Okay, there are some challenges faced. This is um, the focusing of my uh, discussion today. So um, even the benefits are appear in many data that I got, I believe that there are some challenges here, especially for uh, the primary school students. Uh, the some challenges that I found from some data are, com uh, are coming from student side and also the teacher's side. Let us see. Okay, let us see from the student's challenges side here. So from a data that I got from Yoon et al. in 2011 and Q Yoon in 2003, they said that in Korea, some students argued that the use of Korean language to teach subjects concept would give them a deeper understanding. It means that um, in their study about the use of English as medium of instruction in Korea, some students just like feel an uncomfortable about the use of English as medium of instruction. Better they think that the use of their own language, like Korean language is better for them to take the understanding of the uh, subjects learning. And then in according to Owu Iwi in C and Eshan in 2015, found the use of EMI in primary level started, they started in, in Ghana, yeah? in Ghana, in it's similar to Indonesia. It is started from fourth grade to junior high school in Ghana. And then this study found that the main reason to because of the present situation is the student lack of proficiency in the use of English as medium of instruction. So based on those um, situation, I can conclude that there is a reason behind why the students doesn't have like, uh, maybe they feeling uncomfortable to the use of English as medium of instruction. According to Crandall in 1987, he said that the learners may fail to understanding uh, to understand the academic concept through the language. They are still learning because their subject content teachers are incapable of, of, of assessing them to do so. So this is one of the reasons that the main, uh, the main reason is coming from the teacher side actually, because we are talking about the primary school student, as we know that primary school student is depending on the teacher side. According to British Council in 2004, uh, there are a, re a project reported that as many as 46 out of 55 countries joining the study, oh, Indonesia is one of the participants that responded that they do not, that we have no, like they qualified teachers to teach using English as medium of instruction. It means that it will be a very a very big homework for Indonesia to use English as medium of instruction. And then according to He and Chai in 2016, he also found that the inability of subject teachers to communicate in English uh, has made them frequently switch to the uh, student first language. So when the teachers use their English language like science teacher or mathematics teachers use their English language when they are teaching their content subject is like um, they do like switching a language to to teach to give the instruction to the students if they feel the students is not uncomfortable or maybe like um, doesn't understand about what the teachers talk to us it is a, in a line of Marif in 2011 say that many teachers in Indonesia at primary and secondary level still lack of English skill. Marif states that in some case, uh, the English skill of the students is higher than those of the subject teachers. This is what I, what I experienced it before. Um, in some subjects like science and mathematics, sometimes we found that a funny thing like um, where the students is, has, uh, where the students has better English proficiency than the teachers. It's like the teachers being like confused when the students has um, a very good English inside the classroom than the teachers. Maybe uh, I think that is because of the parental involving here. So I think the use of English here from the student side need to uh, help uh, need to some help from the uh, 
parent side. Okay, based on those facts, it is similar to what Ibrahim said, that teachers who cannot speak fluently and accurately will probably be rendered incompetent to perform on one of their shift traditional roles of teaching. So from those um, situation, there are so much arguments, question and critics coming, uh, come up appears to the use of English as medium of instruction. Uh, so is it, so, so that is bad to use English as medium of instruction, isn't it? So according to Airy in 2018, he suggests these are asking the wrong question. So we need to see from the positive side. He suggests we should actually be think about the term of disciplinary literacy. I really agree about this. Even those um, uh, we found so much challenges face, it will be very beneficial we, if we use English as medium of instruction in the corner of disciplinary language. So even you know when the lower level Sorry of for education interruption okay please limit your time thank okay thank, thank you. you okay it will be the last slide okay according to disciplinary uh, language here i mean that the students will be able like you know the primary level based on my experience uh the primary level is different students than the higher level when the primary level is very, very good in accepting something based on what they hear, right? So like when when they can say like, yes or no, it's very, very good already for them to take something beneficial of the use of English as medium of, of instruction, such as the teacher said, uh, please open your book. Please start to read like that all like introduction uh, uh, instruction to the student it will be very benefit beneficial for the students to get some english proficiency of english and then as the rec recommendation and conclusion that i can uh, take uh, put here is yeah maybe some schools that apply english as medium of instruction is already applied professional development, but I think it needs more and should be improved more the professional development, because as we know that the use of English as medium of instruction mostly used in some school that choose themselves to, to apply this uh, phenomenon that this approach, it means that they need to improve themselves of like, uh, itself of like, like, um, like what Yuan Chen and Jingpeng in 2015 said based on his study said, um, the use of professional training to support the EMI teachers, like in the university in China, uh, they uh, he drawing that um, there are some right drawing interview like data from five participants there. The findings show that the program improved to the teacher self effi efficiency by guiding teachers to think about. The nature of English as medium of instruction, its role in content learning and providing modeling and micro teaching practice in a learning community. It means that um, the use of professional development is really need to be improved, uh, especially for those uh, for those schools that apply using English as medium of instruction. That's all about my presentation today. I'm so sorry if there is some mistake inside. Thank you so much. Back to the moderator. Okay, thank you very much for Anawati and all of the presenters today. Now we have a sharing session. Now we will see the question from the participants today. Okay, we, we have we still have 10 minutes. So we can see the questions from the participants. All right, here is Q&A session. And the first question from, okay, the first question from Sunan Hadiputra, YouTube viewer. Okay, thank you very much for YouTube viewer. And this question is for Rizky Aginia Hafiza. The question is, 
Does bilingualism work in our family? Okay, Foriski, please answer the question. All right. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Thank you very much for the question. So the question is coming from Sunan Hadiputra, and the question is, does bilingualism work in our family? All right. So uh, first of all, let me make clear first uh, the term our family that is used on the question. So if we are talking about our family in the context of um, the family that we have here in Indonesia, so uh, basically Indonesian can word, uh, sorry, can can speak more than one language. So we have Bahasa Indonesia as our first, uh, sorry, is uh, as our national language and um, when we were born, I mean, when we were kids, we also use our um, local language, just like Bahasa Indonesia or Bahasa Sunda as our mother tongue. So when we talk about um, the context of our family in Indonesia, yes, it works. Uh, it works that uh, it's true that we, we are bilingual. And um, if you ask about the context of other families who raise the children uh, in bilingualism in English, uh, use, using English as one of the languages. Uh, I also see some, some, some. Uh, sorry, I, I also experience some, some of my students. Uh, some of them they were raised bilingually from kids, uh, with English as one of the the languages that they use at home. So um, I also have uh, one one of my students that is raised in uh, with OPOL so one of the family uh, sorry one of the parents talk in Bahasa Indonesia and and her mom talk in English in relation to my my topic before so um, regarding your question does bilingualism work in our family and my answer is yes thank you okay thank you for risky Next questions. Okay, next questions to Nuru Fauzia. Okay, Nuru, please answer the question directly. Okay. The question from so, Windra Tamarani. Okay, so what do you think about students with no English background, but they have high intention to be in a bilingual program? Is it possible for them? All right, so based on what I explained before that, it is very important about uh, to, to make sure that the student has English background and they have already, you know, had some English background before they enter in a bilingual program. If the case is student has no background at all and but they have high intention, they really want to involve in that kind of program, this is still possible. But there is one consideration that if the student really want to be in a bilingual education program, but they know they have no English background, they need to work harder, very hard, because they know that they don't, they don't have any background with English. So if they don't work really hard, they will, they will be left behind in that kind of program. So what can be done that the students can take another course, let's say they take English course beside that kind of program or prepare themselves before entering, let's say, they are in primary education now. Wait until they are going to go to junior high school, let's say. Prepare themselves first by having a lot of courses then. The f that's the first thing that can be done. So join a lot of courses first, prepare about some knowledge regarding to English, then entering this, the program. But if they really want to directly join the program in, in the mo at the moment, they can still join the program, but they need to promise to themselves that they will work hard and work harder by adding another English courses. So not, they cannot just join the class with intention, but without any, you know, without any preparation. That's what I think. Okay, thank you, Nuru. Next okay. question. Okay, so about implementations of bilingual education program in Indonesia. So when we talk about bilingual education, actually, this is not the new th a new thing in our country. Long time ago, in 2013, like, uh, in our government already, you know, set it in our regulation that kind of 
program which is called RSBI atau Rosklinisan Sekolah Bertaraf Internasional. It has been started at that time ago. So at that time there were a lot of students schools conducted this kind of program. But even though, uh, but the regulation has been cancelled by our government. But the fact is what still there are still right now the bilingual education program is still you know happening many schools conducted this program also in my own perspective based on my observation based of my students sharing with me uh the implementations of bilingual education right now is getting better since the teachers that that used to teach in a bilingual class let's say in one of the school in our country yeah uh, i cannot mention the name but uh right now the the she told me that the teachers, the, the teachers teaching in bilingual class is the one which is has the qualification, the one who has qualification to teach English. It means that even though they teach science, they can teach, in, they can use their English very well. So I think the bilingual education program implementation right now is getting better day by day, and I hope that it will also be better in the future. That's all. Okay. Thank you, Nuru, for. Yeah. The next questions from Yan Ardian and will be answered by Rani Septi. Okay, for Rani. Please answer the question from Yan Ardian. All right, thank you uh, Yan Ardian for your question. So your question is what language ideology fits for current condition? Okay, talking about language ideology, uh, uh, as what I have taught uh, before, that everyone, everyone has different language ideology. It's uh, based on uh, what they, what do they believe toward the language. Uh, but for me, for me myself, um, in the current condition, so language ideology that I hold, that I hold is uh, socio-economic. Why? Since uh, English is used by many people in the world, so it enable us to socialize with society in this current situation and also uh, it will get a benefit for the economic uh, purpose so uh, we will get a better future job in the future and also we will get high salary by by having um, English skills okay that's all about my answer thank you okay thank you Rani Septi and for the next question from Yeni Oktarina and will be answered by Ernawati. Okay. Um, the question is about, is there any way to solve those challenges faced by the students by our, ex by my experience since uh, you said that you have ever seen it? Experience in your teaching. Okay, thank you very much, Yeni Oktarina, for your question. So, based on the experience that I face um, of the use of English as a medium of instruction in a school of Palembang, maybe some of my friends from that school is coming here to see this uh, webinar. Thank you so much for for your coming, actually. And then, so based on my experience here, uh, beside the use of professional development there. Maybe I think based on my experience, we can conduct like a classroom activity for between the content teachers and also the English teachers in once a week or two, uh, twice a week there. So they can combine or being uh, like doing the, co the cooperation between the content teachers and also the English teachers. So like um, the, the English teachers can uh, help them like not teach yeah but like sharing them how to teach how to use the the english language like the easy the, the basic language of english to the students when they they want to deliver the their subjects such as the content subject like science and mathematics and beside that too actually um the teachers the, the teacher self need to 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 think about themselves. You know, this is the modern era. This is the modern world. We need to improve ourselves. We need to develop ourselves, like motivate yourself to you, to like learning more about English as, uh, as a language here. Even if it is a basic language, it will be very useful for you, not only for you as a teacher in this school, but uh, when you are facing the world, like you want to go abroad or, having some traveling, it will be very beneficial for you all. 
we, especially for the teachers, that I very suggest that we need to improve our motivation, our motivation there, and also that one you need to like making that is based on my experience. Yeah, like making a classroom between you as a content subject, and then to all the the English teachers inside that schools. Thank you so much, Yeni, for your question. Okay, thank, thank you, you for Ernawati. Yeah, is there any question? Okay. From Francisca Ika to Riza Rani and Rizky. Okay. Want to answer first? Riza, Rani, or Rizky will answer. Okay, thank you. I'll try to answer this question. Okay, Riza. Okay, the question is, in this case happened to my friend's family, her children are raised in multi multilingual family in their daily communication. My friend, the mother, uses mix of Indonesian and Japanese. The father uses mix Indonesian and Palembangese, while the grandmother, since the children are daily taken care by her, uses Mandarin. The children then suffer speech delay. So my question, yeah, your question is, is it impossible the multilingual multilingualism may inhibit language development are there any theories related to this condition yes um uh, commonly raising bilingual children will have benefits and also the barriers so this case is one of the barriers that can face by bilingual children especially when the children can acquire uh, many languages at once directly so it is supported by apple and peter 2005 and also cunningham 2011 so they are shown there are kinds of the barriers they faced by bilingual children why why can it happen uh, because the children can acquire uh, many languages directly and at once so it may not happen because it will cause uh, the first state the first patient and also uh, have communication difficulties since uh, the children will learn the language differently rules and also different system and also different mechanism of uh, many languages so i think the children will be silent, will be confused, and also will be stressful because they face many language at, at the same time. So I think uh, for parents, uh, for parents to to have and to raise a bilingual children, they do not, uh, they do not, they may not, uh, they may not. Uh, give the children the language at the same time so it will have it must be on the process one by one step by step okay thank you okay thank you very much for uh, the presenters who have already answered the question from the participants okay now the time show that 12 30 and i think uh, I'm very grateful for all the participants, attendants, and also the active participants through the questions. And un unfortunately, we might not be able to address all of your questions, but this can be something that uh, we think about for our future program. So don't forget to uh, fill out the attendance and also exit tickets because uh, if you fill out uh, the attendance form and also the exit tickets, uh, you will get the certificate. Okay, the committee have already shared the link uh, in the chat box. Well, uh, I think uh, that's all from me and I will hand it back to the host. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much for our moderator, Raisa Jopalina, SPDGR, and all the six presenters for such worthwhile discussion.
sadly, we've come to the end of our webinar, but do not worry because we still have four more webinars coming on the following days. So make sure that you are all uh, updated to our uh, webinars that will be held on the four following days. And uh, I would like to tell you that the information of those webinars is uh, will we'll always be posted in our social media pages and make sure you are following our Facebook and also Instagram account, SRS Teflin Official, our Telegram channel, SRS Teflin Official, and also subscribe to our YouTube channel, SRS Teflin Channel. And all these, uh, the video of our webinar today will be uploaded in YouTube so, uh, and you can watch it again. Thank you very much for all the, uh, I really appreciate all the, the attendees who have come and attending our webinar and to spend their precious weekend with this uh, worthwhile discussion. See you on our next webinar. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.